sense by Tony Church combining large numbers of density predictions with Bayesian predictive synthesis. The second one, employment reconciliation and now casting to be presented by uh, Simon van Norden. The third efficient estimation of state space mixed frequency bars to be presented by Aubrey Poon. And the fourth paper on sense of density forecasts, production and devaluation to be presented by me. So each speaker has half an hour. I'll remind you of 20 minutes, depending so that you can choose the carve up between question time and presentation time. But uh, please, <laughs> tell me, please do make a start. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for the introduction. As uh, you pointed out, my paper is about combining large numbers of density predictions with Bayesian predictive synthesis. Um, so, as a central banker, I have to give the usual disclaimer. Uh, these views in the paper are mine, uh, and don't blame the bank for them. Although I don't think I'm saying anything very contentious here. Gotta I guess, uh, cover all my bases. So, first of all, I want to motivate this on. Uh, by kind of explaining why research on density combinations is important. Um, my, fir my first claim here is that forecasting the state of the economy is crucial for policymakers. I mean, to make monetary policy, to make fiscal policy, you need to know the state of the economy. Um, and to do this, you need to forecast or now cast the state of the economy. And um, because of this, good forecasting techniques, like. Well, they inform policymakers on the state of the economy and therefore can improve policy and outcomes. But I mean, we've got a lot of point forecasting models, so why bother with predictive densities and uh, forecast combinations? Well, first, I'm going to sell you guys on the idea of predictive densities. To uh, the econometricians in the room, it's probably not going to be a hard sell, so probably won't linger here that long. Um, well. The reason we I like density forecasts is because they provide, and the reason they're useful is because they provide a full characterization of uncertainty. This is in contrast to point forecasts, which provide no uh, no information at all. If you look at the panel on the left, this is an example of a density prediction from one of my combination exercises. Um, you can see that this density is very informative. If you look at the standard deviation, it shows uncertainty. You can see how confident we are in these predictions or our now casts. And you can look at different moments as well. For example, the skew shows a balance of risks. And um, yeah, this is something that's very important. You can hear policymakers talk about uh, the balance of risk quite often. The projection balance is your upside risk, downside risk, these sorts of things. So um, for that reason, you know, having predictive densities can be quite useful to, in, uh, to inform those assessments. So how about uh, forecast combinations? Why might we want to uh, look at these? Well, number one, just turns out to be a good empirical strategy. This is used by many central banks. Um, it's just very practical solution. Norges Bank uses this, Bank Canada, Bricks Bank, I'm certain other central banks do as well. And this is backed up by decades of research, uh, going back at least, at least 50 years. I want to provide a little bit of information uh, intuition on why might why this might be, why you might want to look at, at multiple models. And this is really for uh, two key reasons. Um, there's different information sets. Each model, different models have different information sets and different modeling assumptions. And so by um, looking at different models, you're going to uh, get a more fulsome, complete picture of the economy. And uh, hopefully this will be able to uh, improve your forecast accuracy. Okay, so there's lots of different ways to uh, combine density forecasts. I'm going to be working in the context of uh, Bayesian predictive synthesis. Um, the reason I use this, well, it's first of all, it's, it's new and it's got really new. It's got several advantages. It's very flexible, so uh, the researcher can choose uh, pretty much an arbitrary way of combining densities. You can choose. It can be a linear regression. It can be however you like. It also allows for model incompleteness. This is in contrast to uh, some other approaches such as BMA, where the true model's got to be in the set. And also another selling point is a strong theoretical background. It's based in um, agent opinion analysis. And so it really provides this um, coherent Bayesian way of uh, combining 
densities. Okay, so what do I do in this paper? Well, I'm gonna compare commonly used big data approaches. I use that with a quotation because it's economics, economic big data. So I'm gonna be looking at um, uh, factor models and uh, shrinkage approaches in the context of uh, Bayesian predictive synthesis. And so in this paper, I'm gonna evaluate widely used global local shrinkage priors. And I'm gonna compare against a novel factor model based uh, combination approach. I think this is an interesting contrast because uh, the weights in each combination are uh, quite different. Global local shrinkage priors are sparse, so the models, the weights will be concentrated on a handful of models, whereas um, the factor model will be more egalitarian or consensual. We'll look at the common movement across, uh, across forecasters and use that to uh, combine the forecasts. And also, I think I find, have some interesting empirical findings. I find that um, global local shrinkage priors uh, provide better forecasts in this context, and that uh, constant parameter models perform better than time bearing. So going a little bit simpler uh, improves forecast accuracy. And I do this in um, two exercises in a now casting uh, environment with 100 uh, or so models. And in this presentation, I'm going to focus on uh, um, forecast from the SPF. So you'll have to read the paper if you want to uh, see the now casting results. All right, so I'm going to start with the econometric approach and give a quick uh, overview of uh, Bayesian predictive synthesis. So basically, BPS provides a posterior for your target variable Y conditional on H, which is your set of forecast densities. So we're going to have H, J here, which are uh, forecast densities provided by either a model or an expert. So in this SPF example, it can be a histogram. Uh, there's another important detail here I want to point out is that we're going to be drawing from this, uh, these forecast densities and the XJs are going to be draws from a given expert density. You know, go through the math, uh, BPS provides you with this uh, expression for the posterior, and there's two important parts here. So you've got alpha, y conditional on x, and this is your synthesis function. Again, you can choose whatever you want, and this is just the way a decision maker chooses to combine forecasts. And then uh, you've got the h's, which are your expert densities. And this implies like a, a simple two-step MCMC, which is going to alternate between estimating your synthesis function, your alpha, and then drawing from the expert densities to get these x's, which you will then estimate your synthesis function on again. And this will build up a posterior. OK, so next I'm going to explain the two combination methods I use. First, uh, start with the shrinkage methods. So we're going to be used, starting with a very general dynamic linear model. Your um, target variable Y is determined by uh, your X's with some uh, betas. And your betas are gonna be time bearing and can also include an intercept. And then you can also add in uh, stochastic volatility. One of the issues is, is that um, in economics, sometimes this X is gonna be quite large and your T, your, um, you know, your um, target variable can be quite, can be quite short. So, for example, we've got our full sample, we've got about 94 cast, 94 cast, so your Y is like, your T is 90, but at the same time, you've got maybe 35, 35 experts. So you're gonna need some way to uh, regular, regularize this, uh, this equation when you estimate it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna impose shrinkage on the betas via global, global local shrinkage prior. Basically what this is gonna do, is gonna try to set some, um, some of the betas to zero. And um, the strength of the shrinkage is determined by two parameters, the kappa, which is global shrinkage parameter. So this affects all, regularizes all the regressors and then components uh, shrinkage parameter of the psi. So this allows um, some variables some or some experts in this case to be uh, shrunk towards zero and other ones to be, um, to have no shrinkage at all. All right, I'm gonna quickly give a few details on the estimation. So there's many global local shrinkage priors. I focus on the triple gamma. The reason for this is it uh, encompasses many of the commonly used priors. 
for example, double gamma, normal gamma, horseshoe, and uh, Bayesian lasso. lasso. It's really nice. It is fully hierarchical, so there's no hyperparameter tuning. You just plug it in and let it go. Uh, I'm going to estimate time varying constant parameter versions of this, uh, this model. And uh, the MCMC has got a few steps estimate parameters by linear regression, latent states via a precision sampler, if, if there are any, and then sample the prior hyperparameters. All right, now the, uh, the contestant here is uh, the factor model or dimension reduction uh, approaches. So basically the idea here is you're gonna summarize the forecasts, the XTs into a handful of factors and it's gonna capture the co-movement of the, of the forecasts. And so um, your synthesis function looks like uh, this equation here. So you've got your target variable is determined by our number of factors. The, uh, we can have time varying beta, stochastic volatility, so on and so forth. All right, again, a few details on estimation here. Use um, kind of by now textbook uh, factor model from Lopez and West. I'm going to identify the factors by restricting the first K elements to be a positive block lower diagonal. Um, this is just a statistical identification scheme. I only do this so that we can actually, so we can interpret the weights. It doesn't affect the forecast accuracy. Again, I'm going to estimate a time bearing constant parameter version. And then the straightforward MC loading, MCMC loadings are estimated by independent linear regressions and uh, just draw factors from a condition normal distribution. All right, so I'm going to hopefully quickly go through the details of uh, the forecasting exercise. I'm going to be uh, using the European Survey of Professional Forecasters. As I said, you read the paper, you'll see a now casting exercise. The results are very similar. Um, anyways, the European SPF is a quarterly survey of ex expectations. It starts in 1999. They ask for probability forecasts on inflation G and GDP growth. I'm focusing on uh, one year ahead uh, GDP growth. Uh, there's a caveat here. There's significant amount of entry and exit in this survey. So this requires some treatment. I mean, you've got a panel of over hundred people. They've all got jobs. You know, the, they're not, the ECB can't make them fill out a forecast every, every quarter. Anyways, um, the first training window I'm gonna be using for this exercise is from 1999 to 2004, evaluation from 2005 to 2020, Q4. Uh, this is nice because it's got GFC in it, uh, Euro area crisis, and more recently, the, uh, the pandemic. And also this is a full real-time exercise. So the SPF forecasters were looking at the data they saw at the time, informing their expectations. I trained the model with the appropriate vintage of GDP, and I evaluate this against uh, the most recent uh, vintage. All right, so I deal with survey entry and exit in two ways. So that results in, um, well, in two data sets. First, I uh, consider a wide data set, and it, the philosophy here is just to use as many forecasters as possible. And this is what the approach at uh, Conflitti, Del Mol, and Giannone use. Um, so have a window of six years, and I drop forecasters with less than uh, five forecasts. This results in a lot of missing data, and it's um, I just fill it in with uh, missing observations from uh, I just fill in the missing observations with un the unconditional distribution of GDP. So this results in a um, really wide data set. There's three five on average thirty five forecasters, a lot of missing data, very short time series. So this is a quite a challenging exercise for a BPS. On the other hand, I've got this uh, tall data set. And in this one, I try to make the longest consistent panel possible. And this is uh, what Diebel, Chin, and Zhang do. So I drop uh, forecasters who have not responded for five consecutive quarters. And then again, fill in the missing data with missing observations with unconditional distribution of GDP. This is a much easier exercise. There's only 14 forecasters in here. Uh, consistent panel, and uh, yeah, much less missing data. While there's only 14 experts, uh, compared to the, the length, uh, the length of the time series, it's still it's still substantial. 
Okay, now I will get into some uh, forecasting results. So, got a big heat map here. So I'm gonna, don't worry, I'm gonna spend, spend a little time to explain this thing. So uh, what we have here is a heat map of the continuous rank probability score. So uh, higher values are worse forecasting performance, lower values are better. Uh, on the top panel, we've got results from the wide data set and the bottom panel from the tall data set. So darker colors are worse, worse forecasting performance, lighter colors are better. On the, uh, on the left, we've got results from uh, shrinkage priors. I guess on, uh, yeah, on the left there, shrinkage priors, and on the right from uh, factor models. And then within those groups, we have on the left, again, the time burn versions, and on the right, the constant parameter versions. So there's a few uh, findings I want to point out here. First is that in general, the uh, shrinkage ones, you, you see a lot lighter colors in the left side corresponding to the, the global local shrinkage priors. There's some exceptions. I'll get to an explanation here. But if you look at, for example, the Y data set, uh, time varying parameters, and compare it to you know, the Y data set factor model, time varying parameters, shrinkage methods perform better. Second, I want to point out is that constant parameter versions uh, result in a significant uh, forecasting improvements. We're talking a range of 20, 25%. You get similar, uh, similar results in the now casting exercise. All right. So, but uh, there's this exception I want to highlight here. You can see that the, uh, the factor models, the constant factor models perform quite well, compar pretty much comparable to the, um, the uh, global local shrinkage priors. And I want to explain this and then go into a little bit more detail there. All right, so this chart here shows the cumulative CRPS difference between uh, the, the triple gamma, which is the best, um, uh, best global local shrinkage prior, and the, uh, the, the factor model with uh, two factors. And so what we can see here is uh, the performance of the cumulative CR, the performance over time. Positive numbers means the shrinkage methods, the triple gamma is doing better, and negative numbers, the uh, factor model is doing better. Um, you know, starting in 2005, looks like the factor model is doing slightly better, and we get the GFC. Shrinkage methods, oh, they perform quite well. They start gaining, gaining, uh, gaining, and uh, you see positive numbers here. There's a bit of a reversal here in uh, the Euro area crisis. And um, well, this is actually due to one of the forecasters uh, disappearing for three quarters. So um, my guess is that they worked at a bank and they either had to uh, make a lot of money or lose a lot of money. So they're uh, predisp like uh, indisposed for this. But anyways, they had about, this one forecaster had about 60% of the weight in this situation. So it, Kind of shows that maybe there could be some risk in the shrinkage methods and putting all your weight, all your, your your eggs in one basket. But when when this forecaster comes back, you can see the shrinkage prior starts to perform better as uh, the number as a cumulative CRPS difference becomes positive over time. And again, we see another a, a reversal of this during the pandemic. Um, the reason for this is it is not so much that the factor models have done well. In that period, I mean, no one, no one forecasted the pandemic um, a year ahead, right? Rather, the variance in the factor models is a little bit higher, so they're punished less severely for the atrocious miss that uh, both the combination methods had. Um, so I think by looking at this, you can see that a lot of the time the shrinkage methods do better, and when they don't, there tends to be some idiosyncratic uh, factors behind it. Um, and then now casting results, uh, we again, we find something similar, but we have less of these idiosyncratic uh, factors. All right, so I will just conclude and then open the floor to questions. So just want to say in most cases, uh, I find that global local shrinkage priors provide more accurate forecasts. 
And I think this is interesting because it implies that a decision maker should focus on a smaller set of accurate experts uh, rather than kind of look at the co-movement or the consensus from, uh, from the whole panel of forecasters. Additionally, there's not much gains from complicated combination schemes. Constant weights perform as well or better than time varying weights. Um, I think this is interesting because a lot of the more recent uh, forecast combination le literature, they're moving towards time varying weights and then some applications are seeing uh, gains from this. But um, when we're looking at uh, forecasting and predicting GDP, it seems like uh, something simpler works well. All right, thanks. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much. Questions, please. I mean, uh, earlier you mentioned you're filling the missing values of GDP, uh, unconditional GDP. Is that just the uh, curve to sample distribution? So, in other words, if you use uh, mean adjusted data, oh, which is a weight of the microphone. Do I restart here? <laughs> I thought it's up, it was loud to you. What? I said, it's up to you. <laughs> I thought I was loud enough. <laughs> oh, I think you're on Zoom, though. Pardon? You're on Zoom as well. Oh, well. Anyways. All um, right. Here. Okay, here we go. So my question goes back to one of your earlier slides where you fill in missing values of GDP. You say it's just the, from unconditional GDP. So is this a, sort of a randomized se selection or is it the mean of some distribution? So the situation <laughs> is that um, we've got these forecasters that just don't show up, right? So right. So we've got this missing, that we've got this missing uh, distribution. There. So all I do is I say, okay, like I'm gonna assume a normal distribution, parameterize it by the mean of GDP that we've seen in, in real time in the center right. deviation. Okay, so you just pick a value out of you pick a value out of that random pseudo randomly. Yeah, yeah. So like <laughs> in BPS, when you estimate the model, you pseudo randomly conditional on everything else. You pull from that forecast distribution, estimate your model, and iterate again. So. It struck me in another general strategy for handling miss, miss, any kind of missing data. If you have stationary data, there's often a big advantage to don't, don't waste time on constant terms. So you, you mean adjust everything. So every, every variable, its expected value is zero. And if something's missing and you, you don't have any more information, i.e. you know using common filter or something, just set that missing value to zero even though logically a missing value and zero are not the same thing, but that's sort of the unconditionally the best estimate you have. But you seem to be doing something similar in a more specific. Yeah, similar. I just need some way of um, like <laughs> guessing what uh, the forecasters would have provided. Right. And so I thought a reasonable approach would be to do this. Like... Other questions? Sorry, just to follow on that, doesn't this bias your Bayesian prediction to have much too low variance? Because you're giving it data that is not real data. And so it thinks it's been given a lot of information and so has a lot more to work with than it actually has, just because you filled it in with unconditional GDP. So, actually it makes a, so instead of giving it something informative, you're actually giving it something less informative, which well, makes- Not nothing though. Nothing is even less informative than unconditional GDP. Right. In fact, you're saying anything at all. So it's something. Yeah, so what we're saying is like, it, saying, okay, this forecaster, they've, they provided 20 forecasts, right? One of, one of these is missing. Right, this missing one. Say, okay, we're going to fill it up with something really naive, right? And it's probably for the forecast for that period is probably going to be bad. So this would actually reduce the weight on that on that forecaster. Yeah. 
Hi, that um, nice talk. Thanks. I just inspired by this conversation, this interest in these factor models and how you treat missing observations. We might have talked about this before, but um, you know, Serena Ng has these latest methods on matrix completion hmm. that we have been using with Ping and Stewart and seem to work really well and would not involve these issues involving drawing from the unconditional distributions or anything. And I think those have only, I mean, Serena Ng's work is also for conventional missing. You have a missing densities problem yes, yes. as opposed to a missing value problem. And it could be kind of interesting to see essentially how her methods work in your case would be an interesting extension possibly. You know, I, I agree. Like um, I've been thinking about ways of imputing these missing densities. Um, in the factor <laughs> model case, you can use it like data augmentation because you've got the factor, right? So you can get the conditional mean, you've got the some variance behind this. So you can do it this way. Um, I'm about like halfway through implementing that. But um, the, the issue is like, it's kind of clear how to, well, maybe. I can see ways of doing this from the factor model approach, but less so for the global local shrinkage prior because you don't have a model for the, for the missing values. So while it's interesting to do it that way, like I'm not sure it's remain, the exercise will remain comparable unless I had some other way of uh, computing them for, uh, the global local shrinkage priors. Hi, lovely presentation, Tony. Um, I just have a really naive question. Could you please go to the uh, slide where you have the uh, comparison, where you have the, yeah, that's the one, mm -hmm. thanks. So I just have a lot of trouble uh, understanding the metric of CRPS. So can you interpret how economically important these differences in forecast performance are? Yeah, like, it's a difficult question, Simon. So it's like, as you know, point forecast of like MSC, root mean squared forecast error, very, very, very clear, right? Um, these scoring metrics, um, there's, there's not the same kind of intuitive interpretation to say like, you know, on average, it's like 50 basis points wrong, right? Uh, so, so when you're talking to senior management, mm -hmm. say at the central bank, the generic central yeah. bank, how do you so, convey to them? So I sell this in two ways. I just say like the score is better. So they're more, it's more accurate. And uh, the CRPS is it's like a density analog to the um, absolute forecast error. That's all that way. The second thing, which I did not present, but I have uh, results in the appendix is by calibration. I say, do calibration testing and say, do these densities accurately represent the uncertainty in the forecasts? And in this case, they tend, they tend to do that, so. Okay, so what are we looking at here? So these are uh, NUPL calibration tests. So what this shows is the null hypothesis here is calibration. So if we reject it, then, well, the forecasts aren't calibrated. And um, so the calibrated forecasts just mean, does the density accurately present? represent uncertainty. So like, if you say there's a 10% chance of this event happening, does on average over the sample, it show up 10%. Does right, and everything's green. Yeah, which is a fantastic result. <laughs> it's... So it makes no difference what we do. Everything looks well calibrated, is that right? So. Am I just confused? No, so we've got well cali good calibration. So all the BPS methods, are mostly calibrated. And then using the other metric, which is the CRPS, we can see which ones are kind of sharper, more accurate. Okay, well, thank you very much. Could we thank Steve for being
Okay, thank you all. Um, so I don't have any disclaimers, but this is a joint work with my three co-authors. Uh, comments are really welcome. We've just gotten a lot of referee reports, so uh, we're turning our minds to think hard at how we can make the paper better. So it's an opportune time to present it. So um, we're not doing, in a sense, anything as econometrically sophisticated as some of the other papers in this session. Uh, we are not doing density forecasting. It, it feels a little strange to be at University of Strathclyde and I'm actually go, you will see some numbers from maximum likelihood estimation, which just somehow feels wrong, but please bear with me. However, in common with some of the other models here, uh, it is a factor model exercise, although it's a different kind of factor model. So um, we're looking at trying to build now casts of employment, and we're looking at the US context where there's actually two sort of headline employment numbers that are released monthly. I, I don't think in this room that I need to motivate why people might be interested in hi. Uh, uh, control L. Thanks. Okay, much better. I, in this room, I don't think I need to explain why people might be interested in what the employment numbers are. So we'll take that as a given. So there's two very different sources for employment data in the US. There's a payroll number, so that's based on an establishment survey. And there's a household number, which is based on a household survey. And they give different results. So here's the raw data that we're analyzing. So the uh, narrower sort of uh, teal or bluish lines are the household survey. And lying underneath that, you can see a slightly broader green line. Uh, those are the payroll survey numbers. Both of these are changes uh, month to month in estimated employment in hundreds of thousands. And so if you look at this, it looks like one series is a lot noisier than the other. So you may think that the household survey, which is based on a smaller sample size and a less complete sample, just suffers from a lot more random measurement error. Or on the other hand, you could try to argue that what's going on here is that the payroll survey is failing to pick up a lot of true high frequency variation and that it lacks enough information about the true state of employment changes. And so it's missing a lot of information that the household survey is picking up. Well, which one of these views is right? Um, that's very hard to say. So uh, just a couple other notes. Um, I should note uh, Shove and Piger uh, suggest that um, the household numbers, although they look noisier, uh, might be more informative during recessions. And generally speaking, if you talk to financial analysts, uh, financial journalists, they tend to put more emphasis on the payroll numbers than on the household numbers. Is, is that a good idea? How should we optimally combine them to come out with an overall assessment of the change in employment? So that's the task we set ourselves. Uh, so to do that, we're going to present a somewhat customized factor model. Now, um, in case I run out of time, which I don't think I will today, let me give you the bottom line. Uh, here we show, again, the initial payroll estimate. Now that is the skinny line. And we come up with our ex post reconciled employment estimate, which you see is the green line. And you see that they're actually reasonably close. We're coming up ex post after the fact 
with a reconciled estimate that is not that far off what payrolls say initially. In fact, our bottom line is that the optimal weight that you'd want to put on the household numbers is pretty close to zero. I'll be more accurate about what we mean by that in a moment. And that the now cast estimate, so if we're filtering rather than smoothing, it looks almost indistinguishable from the initial release of the payroll number. And furthermore, as the data get revised and you smooth through the sample, well, then your optimal filtered estimate really just looks pretty close to just the revised payroll estimate. Um, and we use a rebenchmarked payroll estimate that's usually only available with a delay of well over a year to try to get sort of a uh, unbiased sense of how well the factor model is doing. And it seems to be doing at least as well as several competitors. Now, I should note this paper really grew out of uh, an earlier work with Jan Jacobs and some other co-authors that just came out earlier this year, where we were doing an exercise similar in spirit, trying to reconcile expenditure and income-based estimates of US GDP. Now, there's a much larger literature on that. Uh, Nail Wake, our Woban co-authors have made multiple contributions in that area. And there, using fairly similar techniques, we actually wound up with quite a different conclusion. We found that you really want to put significant weight on both estimates. And um, if you look across the different papers, some put a bit more weight on the expenditure based, some put a bit more weight on the income based. And the weight you want to put on the two depends on where you are in the time span and how much revision has occurred to the underlying series. So at some points, you actually want to put more on income, but then as things get further revised, often you want to put more on expenditure. So we'll look at those kind of questions, but now in the context of the employment data. So let me explain the basic framework that we're working in here and how it differs from a sort of boilerplate simple factor model. In the conventional factor model, we usually think that we have a set of series, Y sub-indexed I, and that they're all functions of some underlying factor, F, could be a, a fine function of F more commonly, I've just kept it simple here. And then we're gonna have an error term. So that's an idiosyncratic term, which we generally assume is gonna be orthogonal to the underlying factor. Now, if you think about what that implies, that implies that the underlying factor has to be less variable or no more variable than the actual series you're observing. But that means that if you're reconciling several series, it means your estimate of the underlying state variable must be less variable than any of the series that you're looking at up to a scaling constant. Whereas we consider the alternative where each of our series is equal to the underlying factor plus the conventional, if you like, measurement error, but also a news measurement error. Unlike the conventional error, the news error, instead of being orthogonal to the factor, it's orthogonal to the particular measure that you're dealing with. That means it's correlated with the true underlying factor that you're trying to measure. This brings about the possibility that the factor could be as volatile or more volatile than some of your underlying series. But that also then gives you a fairly nasty identification problem. How can you determine whether or not your underlying factor should be dominated by these news errors or these noise errors? 
should the underlying state of the economy be assumed to be more variable or less variable than the indicators that you have at hand? Uh, that's a serious question. That's hard to grapple with. But in our earlier paper, we showed that under the right conditions, you can use data revisions in order to make some progress on that issue. And the basic idea here is that subject to having enough data vintages in your model, this can quickly become identified. And in particular, noise errors, you might expect should become less volatile as a series is progressively revised. That's not a restriction that we impose here. But we do impose that news errors, if they're present, should cause a series to become more volatile as it's revised, because presumably more news, more information is being uh, incorporated into the underlying factor. You're gathering more information. So as we show in the previous paper, provided you have serial correlation in the dynamic structure of the factor, this quickly leads to a situation where you can actually identify both the news and the noise components. So now we try to adapt that kind of model to the particular characteristics of employment data in the US, where again, we're gonna work with the current population survey that's gonna give us the household number and uh, the current employment statistics, which is gonna give us the payroll number. Now the payroll numbers go through significant revision and there's some indication that some of the revisions may be to some degree predictable. There may be some slight bias in some of the predictions, whereas the household numbers undergo very little revision, okay? Uh, you go out, you do the survey, you have all the survey results, you come back once a year and you worry about uh, rebasing them to population, you worry about adjusting the seasonals. Those are usually very small adjustments that we think are economically not that significant. Caveat, after March 2020, for the next few years, those seasonal revisions might be a lot more important, okay? But generally speaking. So what we're doing here is that we're going to just work with the initial release of the household numbers. We're gonna ignore revision in that series. And we're gonna focus on the first, second, and third. So the standard releases of the payroll numbers and uh, both series are seasonally adjusted. They're monthly changes. This is a typo. The series actually start in 1961. So we're using a nice long data sample. Okay. So here again is the raw data that I showed you initially. So we have one series much more variable than the other. And when we feed that into our results, now I should note here, that what we're doing, we're not doing forecasting. This is not a full real-time exercise in that we're doing full sample parameter estimation and we're looking at what Coleman gains we're getting as a result, what filtered and smoothed estimates of the underlying series we're getting, we're not doing rolling estimation, okay? So what do we see? Well, we're going to look at the standard deviations of the news components and the noise components associated with the household series, the first release of the payroll, second release of the payroll, third release of the payroll. And to get an idea of the relative importance of these two components, we'll look at their ratios. And what we see is a stark difference in the news to noise ratio across the two series. We're seeing that for the household numbers, our model says this is basically all noise. 
the news component is vanishingly small, and we're finding a contrary result in the payroll numbers with most of the information coming from the initial release, a good bit of uh, information still coming from the first revision, and a little bit more from the third or often called final release. Um, there's work by Aruoba et al. looking at uh, GDP where they say, well, look, if we've got series estimates coming from two completely different statistical surveys, it should be reasonable to expect that their measurement errors are going to be uncorrelated. One of the advantages of our method is that we don't have to assume that the news or the noise information is uncorrelated across these two sources. You certainly wouldn't expect the news components to be uncorrelated. So we've tried doing this, imposing the restriction that the noise components are uncorrelated across the two series or relaxing that, we find it makes no economically significant difference. So we get much the same results. So what do we get when we look retrospectively? So if we're looking at a smoothed estimate, we have the information on the, pay, the household series, and we have all three releases of the payroll series. Where does the weight uh, fall in creating our smoothed estimates? Uh, we've tried a variety of different estimation methods. Uh, yeah, we do maximum likelihood. Uh, we also do MCMC. And uh, because there's a difference in scale in the employment changes and the slight difference in mean, uh, we also allow for a constant and a slope coefficient on the household uh, estimates of employment change. So it makes the most sense to look at this column and this column, but they're giving us pretty much the same results. Uh, you're basically putting 100% of the weight on the final series of the payroll numbers. So that's telling us the same story. Uh, the household numbers aren't telling us anything and there doesn't seem to be so much noise in the payroll numbers that you'd want to average across different releases either. Um, so this is what we get as a final picture if we compare the initial payroll release uh, to the reconciled estimate. So that's our smoothed estimate of the underlying factor. So what we're seeing here in the thin lines is the difference between the initial payroll estimate and our smoothed or reconciled estimate. And the green line is simply the difference between the now cast estimate. So that's the filtered estimate of our factor and the initial estimate. So what we see here is that, you know, our filtered estimate really just puts all its weight on the initial release effectively. And then all the variation that we're seeing afterwards is really just reflecting the revisions in the payroll numbers. So if you, to roughly characterize this, we're winding up almost at a corner solution, okay? Uh, we can go through exactly how the Coleman gain changes as we sit and try to estimate the, our, the estimate of our factor for the most recent month. So we only have initial releases, or if we try to estimate it for the previous month. So we have an initial and a first revision for the payroll number. And then when we have effectively full information, again, we really wanna focus on the estimates allowing for a constant and the slope coefficient. And we see that they're giving us very similar results. Uh, and effectively in all cases, even if we only have the initial household and the initial payroll number, we still wanna put more than 98% weight on just the payroll number. It's very hard for us to find an important role for the household numbers. 
Now, I will note that this data sample ends in at the end of 2019, December 2019. Uh, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Now, as a check on these results, there are several people have suggested to us that, well, you know, they actually, the difference between the household estimate and the payroll estimate is technically, they're trying to estimate different things, okay? Their definitions of the scope of unemployment that they count is somewhat different, but the statistical agencies put out estimates that attempt to reconcile the employment numbers to the payroll numbers and reconcile the payroll numbers to the employment numbers. Um, some of these only go back to 94. Other ones, as I mentioned, are only released with a substantial delay. So the question with any kind of factor model is, well, how can you validate your factor? So what we try to do here is we simply try to compare our latent factor estimates to the eventual benchmarked uh, payroll estimate. So that's an estimate from the payroll data that's coming from a near census of establishments that they try to compute on a basis comparable, I'll say, to the household number. And what we find uh, is that, whoops, uh, if we're looking at mean absolute errors, we find that uh, when we're using our full sample estimates of the underlying factor, we're getting smaller deviations from those reconciled numbers that are only available after a delay of a year or two than what we'd get either with our now cast estimates or just using the first release of the payroll. So we found that as a comforting kind of sanity check on the realism of our underlying factor estimates. Now, I'd like to come back to the pandemic. Um, in uh, March 2020, uh, the change in payrolls was dramatic. Uh, we saw a drop in employment that was just a little bit over 100 standard deviations from the mean. Um, I got a little distracted by that number. I tried to understand if you assume a normal distribution, how probable is it that you see a deviation from the mean that large? Um, I'm told that if you're eight standard deviations from the mean, that's something equivalent to, uh, it's something you should observe if you sample one observation a day since the Big Bang, then that's roughly the probability that you'd be eight standard deviations from the mean. Um, if you are sampling the number of particles, I guess they're atomic particles in the known universe, then you're getting something on the order of 30 standard deviations from the mean. If you're working with IEEE double precision floating point numbers, you can handle things up to about uh, 10 to the minus 300. Okay, uh, so I had to break out the uh, arbitrary precision modules in R. Uh, and it says, yeah, the probability of seeing such a large change in employment under a normal distribution would be roughly uh, a probability of six times 10 to the minus 2,300 some odd, if you believe those calculations. So it's not very likely. Now, that means the statistical assumptions that our estimation procedure is founded upon, if we extend that into the COVID era, are uh, a bit doubtful, I would say, but we were curious to see how it would perform 
So we added 13 observations, okay? Now, some of those observations are rather extreme, and as you might expect, they uh, changed some of our parameter estimates. Um, they didn't actually change our filtered or smoothed estimates all that much, but let me take you through this one step at a time. Here's the raw data again, where now I've extended the sample out to January 2021. So I've added 13 observations at the end here. It doesn't look very different until you notice that a few observations have been clipped. So you see the same data on a revised scale that doesn't clip the data on the lower scale. So there we see the collapse and rebound in uh, early 2020. And that's what a hundred standard deviation shock looks like. So here we've got the estimated standard deviations, or sorry, no, these are the common gains from uh, our original sample and from the slightly extended sample. And you can see that qualitatively, we're getting very similar results. All the weight is on the initial payroll estimate. If we're estimating the most recent month for which we have data, if we have complete data, so we have the initial release and two revisions, well, then we actually start doing a little bit of averaging over the last two releases, uh, but we're still... Okay, I should wrap it up, thank you. Um, we're still putting effectively no weight on the household numbers. So let me uh, jump to the conclusion slide. Uh, Ex post, uh, we're getting revised estimates that look to us surprisingly close to just the initial payroll estimates when we're at the end of sample and the fully revised payroll estimates when we have more information available um, and that the optimal weight on the household numbers is pretty close to zero. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, please? Hopefully a very, a very uh, uh, simple question. Has anyone done this sort of exercise for UK data? Because the story you tell is just so familiar to what we've been grappling with with our labour market data in the UK over COVID. We've got our labour force survey, which of course was, had to be moved online from face to face overnight with all the problems there. And we relied very heavily on admin data from HMRC, so our payroll data, but admin not surveyed. Um, but now we see that has bias in it that we were not expecting in, its, in terms of its revisions. So it would be, it would be wonderful to get a, a sense here of you know, who, what we should pin our colours to, a, a better survey or stick with the admin data, but uh, adopt better methods. Uh, that's not really a question, given that I'm sure you know who's been working with the UK data better than I do. But we, we can talk afterwards. Thank you. Really nice paper, Simon. I, I just have two quick questions. Uh, in terms of the revisions, have you played with serial correlation in the revision? Uh, no, we haven't. Now, this is drawing, this is elaborating an earlier structure I did in a paper with uh, Jan Jacobs, where we allow for revisions to be serially correlated. Now, let's be clear what we mean by serially correlated revisions. Um, they can be correlated across calendar time. So for example, that's what we'd expect if say at the end of the year, we get income tax data 
and we go back and revise all the data from the previous year based on that. Is that the kind of serial correlation you're talking about? We haven't tried that. Uh, we probably have to redo the identification proof just to make sure we've got enough degrees of freedom, et cetera. Uh, it's technically feasible. We understand how to introduce that into, a, into the state space framework, but we haven't tried that. And the second question I have was with regard to the identification, I wonder if you are working with the changes in the employment series, right? Yeah. I wonder if there is a possibility of using the co-integration between the levels of the series and that may help you in resolving the identification problem because if you are looking at two series they are co-integrated with each other and then the cycles will have enough dynamics to give you the leverage in terms of identifying those extra parameters yeah um we're hesitant to go the co-integration route i mean there has been some work by others in this field looking at co-integration relationships and levering it just as you suggest um, some of what made us hesitant and, and sort of the trade-off you face is some people have shown uh, pierre Ciclos comes to mind that if you take vintages of data that are far enough spaced in time uh, early vintages no longer seem to be co-integrated with later vintages you get benchmark revisions and such that actually destroy the co-integrating relationship within a single series. Uh, and so those kind of things kept us away from that. You, you also have to worry a bit more about level shifts. So for example, uh, when they get the new population estimates and, and everything shifts up and down, uh, using the first differences helps mitigate some of those definitional and methodological changes. But um, you're right, uh, using co-integration does bring some other advantages to the table that can potentially offset that in some applications. Um, great paper, very interesting. I just wondering, of course, all the details come at me very quickly and things like that. Yeah, yeah. But relative to your previous work, which I know better, you're getting these striking results relating to, um, you know, no weight at all on the on the HH. And I just wanted to have, I mean, of course, you are always exploiting data revisions to identify. Yeah. And there's this other Arova tradition, which uses the um, which uses the un possibly uncorrelatedness of the two data sources to identify. Can you just remind me again, to, with, if you use their term methodology, what happens? Right. We can't use that methodology, I think, in this context, because it's perfectly reasonable to assume that if we have noise measurement errors, that from two different data sources, we should have independent sources of noise. That's a reasonable assumption to put in. And, and that I believe is the context in which they're using it. But on the other hand, if we think that there's news in data releases, then we would expect that two different data sources can both be picking up the same underlying source of news. So then we no longer have that kind of a orthogonality. Uh, maybe that's another way of saying that I don't immediately see how we can apply their methodology here. Uh, that's not saying that it's impossible, but. I would interpret what you're saying is that their identification description is a bad one, but mechanically, surely couldn't you just simply do it and just almost as a robustness check, make that assumption, even though you would argue that's a bad one. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can always take their it's numbers as far as I know and just pound the data through it but I wouldn't think then that we're coming out with something comparable in the sense that we're saying, uh, yeah, that, that the errors, the revisions, uh, the uh, information in the revisions for new, for the payroll numbers must be orthogonal 
to what's going on in the household numbers. It's a little complicated because now we don't have revisions in the household numbers in this particular model. Yeah. yeah. That's what it almost sounds suspicious this way. That I agree. And that has no revisions at all, gets zero weight. You have an identification scheme based on revisions. It's very I agree with you. And one of our referees agrees with you. And uh, it, it, he's put his finger right on it. And, and I have a lot of sympathy for that critique. And we're trying to think. So one potential argument is that we've got three series and one. And the fact that we've got three makes you want to put more weight on that. And well, we could just use first releases of both, but then we lose identification. The identification comes from using multiple releases. And so we could throw in the seasonal adjustments perhaps on the household numbers, but then we're getting near non-identification because you actually need real revisions. If the sigmas are effectively close to zero, you start to lose that as well. Um, the other possible argument actually is that an important component of the identification comes from the serial correlation, the persistence in the underlying factor. And it's actually that that's mitigating the weight that you're putting on the two series. So it may simply be that the payroll numbers look like they're more serially persistent than the household numbers, but we need to do more investigation to really back up that hunch. Thank you, please, for really interesting Thank you very much. Um, so, this paper is joint work with Josh and Dan, and let's just start. So, so um, mixed frequency bar. So, this paper is centered on, um, on a mixed, mixed frequency bars. So, mixed frequency bars has been um, very popular in empirical macro for now passing. Oh, sorry. Am I <laughs> uh, yeah, it's okay. I'll. Okay, yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. Um, yeah, so mixed frequency bars, very popular in empirical macro, especially for now casting and forecasting. So there's two common approaches. Um, the stacked approach, um, um, which is um, pioneered by um, um, Guy Gizes. So it's Gizes, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry, can't pronounce it. But um, so in their approach, um, they treat um, all the low frequency variables, they model the model as all low frequency variables. Whereas um, in the state space approach um, pioneered by Shofar Ding Song, uh, they treat um, the mixed frequency, the VR approach as a state space. So in a sense, they model the, um, the, the um, Shofar Ding Song model, they model um, uh, the model, the state space approach in all high frequency models. In that sense, they treat all the missing observations of the low frequency variable as latent states. And they use some sort of um, the standard practice of filtering and smoothing um, methods to interpolate these uh, missing observations. So the, our main goal of this paper is we, we develop a more efficient um, algorithm, this position-based algorithm to estimate uh, mixed frequency state space VAR models compared to um, traditional um, standard methods of filtering and smoothing um, methods. Yeah. Um, uh, um, computationally, um, more computation faster, more faster. faster. Yeah, faster. Yeah, so in efficient means faster. So, so I guess one of the advantages, as I mentioned, um, um, over the state space approach, over the stacked approach, is that um, um, we model everything in the highest um, frequency. So, for example, a great example of a mixed frequency um, state space bar could be um, you have um, the high frequency variable is monthly variables, and the low frequency variable is um, the quarterly variable. And so, in that case, 
you're modeling everything in the um, uh, monthly frequency and the, the missing observations of the quarterly uh, variable, you interpolate that or you treat that as the, the latent estimates. So um, one of the drawbacks with um, estimating a mixed frequency sex space uh, VAR, as I said, because now you're treating all the low frequency missing observations as latent states. So um, that means you have a large amount of um, 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 latent estimates um, to estimate. And if you use standard filtering methods um, and smoothing methods, and as the model, as the, the dimension of the model increases, it can be very um, computationally um, intensive um, or very slow to estimate. Um, so what we do is, as I said, we um, provide or we propose a more faster position-based uh, method of um, sampling all these missing observations of the low frequency variable. So um, position-based um, approach, um, it's, it's been around, so it's basically the brainchild of uh, my PhD supervisor, Josh. Um, so um, I think um, in the first presentation by Tony, um, he mentioned he used um, position-based. So position-based method have become very um, popular in um, empirical macro. And I think um, in the session, uh, afternoon session yesterday, uh, so he, um, in his presentation, he, he was using position-based uh, methods too to estimate stack space um, uh, methods. So it's becoming quite popular. So, so how do we um, go about um, um, drawing the missing observations of these low frequency variables uh, by using the position-based sampler? So there's two steps. Um, the, the first step is we need to derive the um, conditional distribution of all the missing observation of the VAR. And then um, once we've got that, um, we sample from this conditional distribution subject to some sort of intertemporal constraint. So in a mixed frequency um, VAR uh, literature, normally what people impose is this uh, temporal constraint. It's basically you're linking the, the, the actual observe um, low frequency variables with the, the latent estimates of the missing observations of that particular uh, missing observation. So, um, so first, the first step what we need to do is we need to derive this conditional distribution of um, the missing observation of the VAR. So um, this is, let's just define a standard VAR, but now we have, um, as I said, um, this mixed frequency VAR, we, we have two frequencies. So here, this, um, this vector here, you can think about this is the observed uh, or the high frequency, for example, monthly, monthly variables. And this vector here is um, the, the low frequency variable, um, for example, um, the quarterly um, variable. So you can sort of think about this as um, in a standard macro um, context, um, you know, you might have the, the high frequency variable here. Um, the monthly example of a monthly indicator could be um, um, unemployment, industrial production, and then the low frequency variable example of that is just a real GDP. Okay, so, okay, so then what, um, what we can do is we can rewrite um, equation one, which is just a standard VAR. Um, based into some sort of um, stacked linear regression matrix form. So we can rewrite this and this H matrix is sort of like a, a banded uh, sparse matrix. And this is where we exploit the, um, the computation gains with um, the position-based estimate. So from equation two, um, then what we can do is sort of, because we know our, our full um, observed data, we can sort of partition that as a linear combination. So in a sense, the, um, uh, consist of um, the observe or high frequency data and um, the low frequency data uh, or the low frequency data. So then from equation three, 
what we can do is we substitute it back in equation two, and then this gives us um, um, sort of a, a, a linear regression stacked um, across T for the VAR. And from, um, from four, we can sort of expand it. We can expand, um, given that our errors is uh, normal or Gaussian, we can expand that. And you can sort of see that now we can sort of um, see the conditional density um, of all the missing observations for the low frequency variable. Uh, um, we can expand that. And if we assume that um, this, um, this term here is the position matrix and you know, then following some rules, um, then we can sort of see that the, the conditional uh, distribution of the missing observations has a kernel of a normal distribution. And then we can sort of see now that um, the conditional distribution of all the missing observation is, is just a Gaussian. And since um, um, H, since all these matrices are all band matrices, we can use the position sampler of uh, um, Chan and Jelikoff and draw all the missing observation in one block. So instead of using uh, filtering methods, um, that's time dependent. It depends on the, um, the previous time. But in this particular position-based sam um, sampler, we can draw all the missing observation in one shot. So it's more faster algorithm compared to standard filtering methods. Um, so, so as I said um, in the earlier, normally in, these, um, in the mixed frequency literature, people impose some sort of um, um, temporal constraint. So a, a common um, uh, intertemporal constraint that people impose, if you, for example, when you estimate uh, uh, a monthly and quarterly var is this um, five lag um, temporal constraint by this JE paper by Marano Misawara. So this, as I said, this is, for example, your observe um, low frequency variable. And these here, these estimates here are your, your your latent estimates of the missing observation, and you're just linking it um, or anchoring it, making sure you anchor it. Um, so it's sort of like you're, you're making it um, the later estimates to uh, discipline or um, anchor it to the observed um, quarterly value. And from five, we can, you know, we can write um, these, all these temporal constraints, and we, stack, we can stack them on top um, over time. And then um, what, so then how do we, then what we can do now is uh, we can draw the um, um, uh, missing observations. So, so in the first case, what I've defined here, this is you're drawing um, all the missing observation um, without any constraints. So without the temporal constraint. But here, because in the literature, we want to impose this temporal constraint. So firstly, what we want to do is we draw all the, uh, missing observations, and then we correct that um, by entering this um, formula um, by these people, and that corrects for the constraint. And now um, it can be shown that now um, all the, the draws from the missing observation for the low frequency variable satisfies uh, the temporal constraint, which we've defined in equation five. Yeah, so yeah, so that, so um, yeah, so in that sense, you can draw everything in one shot, all the missing observation across um, um, time in one single block. So how do we, um, so in the next um, exercise, we wanna show how our position-based sampler compares to traditional methods, like the, the filtering methods and um, standard simulation smoother of Cardinalcom and Durbin Cooper. So basically what we do is, we assume like a, in the DGP, we assume a, just a standard VAR with five lags. And here you can sort of think um, this DGP follows just a, a monthly quarterly um, structure. So here um, this vector Y zero um, is basically, you can think about these are monthly variables and the, the Y U vector is basically just a, the quarterly variables, that's what you can think. And here's our, we just set a particular um, 
um, values for the, the, uh, the VR coefficients. And then we just assume uh, uh, the standard um, temporal constraint that also oh, that um, I just mentioned here. Okay, so then um, what we do is we consider six different types of DGPs and they vary across um, um, the number of um, quarterly variables and number of uh, monthly variables. And then what we do is we estimate uh, um, a mixed frequency state space VR based on four approaches. So our position-based sampler, that's what I just described um, um, just now. That's our, um, and then we also do a variant, uh, a position set sampler of a soft constraint. So what a soft constraint is, is basically here, you can sort of see this, we're imposing the temporal constraint exactly, there's no error. So the soft constraint is just, we're just, the soft um, constraint is just, we're just putting a plus error. We're just fixing an error there, a very small error. So you can sort of think that sort of approximation, a very small approximation error. And then um, the third method we use is the, the Cardin Com simulation smoother. So this one is just straight out from the Shofardi um, and Song JBS um, code. So we didn't change anything. We just um, got their code and we're running there. And then, so one of the referees, um, they were very skeptical um, regarding our you know, um, game. So, and they reckon Durban Koopman um, provides a better um, simulation smoother than the Cardinal Com. So, so then we added a Durban Koopman. So we estimate the simulation over you know ten parallel chains, and then so so here let me just describe this. So, so this panel here, the first panel, first column here, that is the number of um, you can think the number of quarterly variables or the low frequency variables, and he, this second column denotes the number of um, high frequency variables or um, the number of uh, monthly variables. So the mean squared error. So that's based upon um, the 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 um, the low freak, the interpolated uh, missing values of the um, um, the low frequency variables. So we're co we're comparing the estimated against the simulated, and you can see that here across all the the different types of uh, model size. Um, our position-based methods gives the same as the standard um, simulation smoother of Cardinal Com and Durbin and Koopman. But you can see here, for example, um, our methods are a little bit more um, faster, um, or yeah, I should just say a little bit, but more faster. So for example, if you look at, um, um, like for example here, uh, a 15 variable uh, mixed frequency VAR. So in this case, we have uh, 10 monthly variables and five quarterly variables. You can see that our position-based method is um, a lot faster compared to simulation um, smoothers like Durbin and Koopman and Cardinal and Com. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's quite funny because because um, one of the referees said Durbin and Koopman was, he, he was very adamant that Durbin and Koopman was really fast, but yeah, it's really slow. And the reason why is because I think with the Durbin and Koopman, because um, we're in the mixed frequency fake space, um, how they do the simulation smoother is they write it in compact form, but you can't do that with the um, Durban Koopman. And we've tried that, There's, it doesn't work. So you have to write, um, um, the only, so we tried it, the, what, the, the Durban Koopman only works when you write the VR um, in companion form. And when you write it in companion form, it's, it's a lot more computationally, um, inefficient and and also you have a lot of um because in a sense in this mixed frequency stake space because mm -hmm. you're observing because you have to skip a step in terms of the filtering and for the Durban Koopman it's a lot more um uh, inefficient because you have to write a lot of uh, uh, for loops so or if functions I mean so that's why um it's very um the Durban Koopman is very slow um so this is just a graph computation graph in terms of, for example, if we fix um, the, the time period to be 300 and the lag to be five, this just plots the, in terms of, um, I think this is the number of monthly variables and um, this just plots 
um, the computation times in seconds in terms as we increase the number of uh, monthly variables. And you can sort of see here the Durbin Koopman um, is very computationally intensive as you increase the number of uh, monthly variables. Um, and similar, um, if you increase the number of low frequency ver variables, you can see the Durbin Koopman is very um, in computationally intensive and similar with the carbon com. And, our, our methods relatively, um, or our position-based method is relatively um, um, uh, fast. So yeah, similar settings in terms of T and, and the lags. So, uh, you know, I'm running out of time, so I'm, I might skip that. So here, this is a, just another study that we added to the paper. One of the referees was saying, oh, you know, you, you, how does your method handle um, um, unbalanced, missing, uh, unbalanced missing data panel? So basically what we did here is we just estimated um, like a, a 10 variable monthly, var a, a, 15, a 13 variable VAR where we had three um, low frequency variables. And here we just assumed that we have a large amount of missing data um, in selected periods. So here the selected missing data, for, you can see the ones that are highlighted are highlighted where there's large amount of missing data just to show that um, we wanted to show that our position-based method can also handle that. And basically, you know, you can see it's very much the same. Um, you can see the, the for that particular case, the mean squared error is pretty much the same, but um, the position-based method is still um, a little bit more faster or more faster. Okay. So, um, so in our empirical application, we do two things. We, uh, we apply our mixed frequency sampler to two macro applications. So the first application we do is we incorporate the, the precision-based sampler into a, a large um, um, Bayesian VAR with SV and with global local prize. 10 minutes left including questions. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so I can slow down there. Um, so that one, due to time, I'm not um, giving you the results, but um, I'll be focusing on this um, second application where we sort of extend this AJ macro by Kadao and Hearst. Um, so in their uh, particular application, they estimate this um, Bayesian proxy VAR, where they use a proxy to identify a monetary policy shock. So what we do is we extend that, that particular model um, by proposing a mixed frequency Bayesian proxy VAR, which I don't, don't think nobody's done that in the literature. So, so in the original AEJ macro uh, paper by Caldon and Hearst, they just estimate a monthly frequency um, five variable um, prox uh, Bayesian proxy VAR. So these are the, the five um, um, variables that, that are cho chosen and they use this particular um, sample size. So everything, we just took what they did. So we didn't change anything. So the only thing we, we did is we just um, extended the model and included um, 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 real GDP, sorry, um, real GDP. Because here um, in this particular model, they use industrial production as a measure of real activity. But if you look at the, if you plot um, the percentage of industrial production as a percentage of real GDP, that's, that, that's, that is declining over time. So it may be the case that um, using industrial production as a real economic activity may not be a good measure. So that's the reason why we, um, we wanna add real GDP because that's a, you know, a better measure of real activity. So in, this, in terms of this model, um, so we add, all we do is take the Kadar and Hearst monthly model and add quarterly um, um, real GDP. And because everything's in log levels, we have to impose this, uh, we impose this, um, this average um, or similar to what Shofar and Song does. And as, as I said before, everything's all preserved. All the model as, uh, assumptions of Kadao and Hearst are the same, but um, we add um, um, real, G, real GDP. Okay, so then what we do is, um, um, these are inter the impulse response functions um, identified using this um, proxy VAR or proxy or this monetary policy instrument. 
So in the original um, AJ Macro um, paper, um, um, these the, the Fed funds rate, industrial production, unemployment, uh, producer price index, and the BEA spread, they were the original um, 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 in the original model. And I can tell you that that the impulse response um, are exactly the same. So adding real GDP um, doesn't really affect the impulse response. Ha However, um, um, real GDP, um, that's all good. I don't, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so um, all the monthly variables, the impulse response are the same as um, um, Kadao and hers. Um, there's nothing changed, but you can see that here, real GDP, um, the response is very minor or man, more muted, but compared to the Fed, compared to industrial production here, you can because industrial production is the um, you can think about it's a proxy of real activity, but here you're sort of saying that it seems like a, a, a shock to monetary policies um, sort of has a greater effect on real activity but then if you look at real gdp it's sort of more muted so what this is sort of saying could be that you know if you don't have real gdp in your um, um in your model um using industrial production maybe you know overstating the shot to um, or overstating the impact of monetary policy shock so um yeah so that's a another I guess a, a good insight of why you need to use a, a mixed frequency model. Um, so, or a mixed frequency state space model. Okay, so then, um, yeah, so I'll conclude in the sense we've developed a position based sampler um, to draw all the missing observation of the low frequency variables uh, for a state space VAR. Our method is um, computationally or more faster compared to standard um, filtering and smoothing um, estimates. And also what we're doing now is that what I propose here is um, the precision based um, on um, um, uh, stake space models really with missing data. But what we can do, what I'm doing now with my co-authors is we're extending this approach to um, conditional forecasting. Um, so what we're doing now is where we can apply our same methodology into conditional forecasts. So for example, um, um, the Wagner and Zar, that's the conditional forecast uh, method. We can apply our position-based method um, on the Wagner and Zar method, and it's more efficient, especially the, the soft constraints. We can um, do a lot more faster. And also our position-based method um, we can also apply it to many other fields like the beverage and Nelson decomposition. We can do a conditional forecast on the beverage and Nelson decomposition. But that's a, another um, um, thing that me and Dan are working, too many things. Time yeah, question. yeah, and uh, uh, finished. Yeah. So several questions, please. Two. Uh, yeah um probably yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, the relative superiority of your uh, precision based approach seems to be declining compared to carter and cohn when the nu and n0 is large yeah so yeah is so there, is there any reason yeah yeah so um as you have a lot of so the one of the problems with the position sampler is that as you increase the number of latent states, the the bad, these matrices become, or the, these banded matrices becomes a lot more dense. So it takes, um, so it's a little bit or sl slower. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so our method is very good in the median size, but as for example here, um, as you increase it to probably, for example, like 10, um, if you have 10 like um, low frequency variables, then yeah, it's a bit difficult to estimate. But, you know, in the literature, nobody except for probably um, that I work with Gary and Stuart 
we no, nobody really estimates um above um three yeah you know we, you know we haven't seen it but yeah the problem is that it becomes more dense um so you can't exploit the or the sparse structure that's that's one of the caveats with it yeah you correct me if i'm wrong that the dgp you're using is always hard yeah yes that's correct yeah so in a sense precision soft is the only one where the posterior yeah. is not the right one so yeah 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 that's right yeah 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 and now looking at these more carefully precision in the in the actual in the actual data too i often want to use precision hardware yeah so what's the point of precision soft it looks like you're only minor gains in precision in it's just um it's just we're assuming there's an approximation error a small approximation error yeah what's the benefit it's, a, it's a, slightly a yeah. little bit i think josh says it's slightly a little bit um uh, faster yeah and i think because it makes it a little bit more sparse some of the matrix so you can exploit the the sparsity with that but yeah yeah it's very minor yeah. it's very minor but um yeah yeah. Okay, well, thank you very no, much. Okay. Thanks. Just I can put that on this morning. Thank you. So thank you very much for the final paper of this session, sense of density forecasts, production and evaluation. But actually, in the in this talk, I'm going to focus on production evaluation would stretch us for another half hour, and uh, I thought I'd rather though, focus on the on the issue of production. Uh, James, no, my co-author, is now at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland and uh, has put in a no disclaimer that these views aren't those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland or of the Federal Reserve System. I should say that we started this work when I was still at the Bank of England. And if these views are, if the views expressed here aren't the views of the Bank of England, they ought to be. I think that's <laughs> all I can say on that matter. So what's the issue with estimating or producing density forecasts based on past experience. This chart shows pre-pandemic what the distribution of the Monetary Policies Committee's forecast errors used to look like for the GDP growth rate two years ahead. And you can see, perhaps not surprisingly, in the weight of the general body of evidence that uh, has built up, built up, that there is a very long tail on the left hand side. Those are, of course, the forecasting errors associated with the 2008 recession. And uh, you don't have anything like that on the upside. Now, the Monetary Policy Committee likes to characterize it you know, pro to produce density forecasts which allow for skew. And so, in principle, allow for this. But the question that I wondered about was supposing you wanted to estimate the parameters of your error distribution from past forecasts, how would you go about doing it? Well, before I get on to that issue, let me say a bit more about forecast errors. This chart is the same as the previous chart, except we have put in the forecast error associated with the first quarter of the epidemic. And that, of course, was on a scale that uh, no one had ever seen before, no one had ever anticipated. If there are fewer spikes to the histogram, that's just because the scale is well, I should say much more extended rather than much more compressed. Instead of going down to minus eight, it has to go down to minus 25. But essentially, in both cases, what we see is a very large left-hand skew. And what should you do about that if you want to estimate, you know, based on past experience, to provide some 
know, some indication of the distribution of forecast errors. Well, it's by no means unknown for estimates of, uh, for assessment of future uncertainties to be informed by monitoring past forecast errors uh, based on Reif Schneider and Tulip's article. That approach seems to be followed at uh, a number of the forecast, you no, know, of the major central banks, but the practice varies across institutions. So, for example, the Monetary Policy Committee, as I mentioned, use the two-piece normal distribution. The Federal Reserve Board emphasise a 70% interval forecast, but that's essentially one standard deviation each way based on the assumption that the underlying distribution is Gaussian. So how should we accommodate extreme forecast errors or outliers when producing and evaluating probabilistic forecasts based on historic forecast errors. Well, for those of you who, if there is anyone who isn't familiar with the sort of diagram that the Monetary Policy Committee produces, this is a recent fan chart from the Monetary Policy Committee showing the distribution of GDP during the forecast period, during the projection period, and you can see that there are three shades to the colored bands. Each shade represents 30% of probability mass, so the shaded area represents a 90% subjective probability of the outcome, and the remaining 10% the question was, is the Monetary Policy Committee offering any view on the distribution of that remaining 10% or not? And I think if you read the inflation report, you or Monetary Policy Review, as it's now called, you get the impression that the Monetary Policy Committee has gradually changed its mind about the way in which it sees the white area over time. So initially one got the sense that uh, the distribution used to calculate the central 90% also applied to the outer 10%. Of course you have to say something about the outer 10% if you're producing an expected value for the outturn, but the Monetary Policy Committee typically focused on a modal value rather than an expected value, and uh, there was always a tension. People treated it as an expected value, but in the period of the financial crisis, and more particularly, I remember during the euro area crisis, we came to the conclusion that it would be quite convenient not to have to say anything about the outer 10% of the distribution. So in the May 2010 inflation report, the, it was stated for the first time that you know, on 90% of the occasions, GDP falls in the green area. On the remaining 10%, of, of occasions, growth can fall anywhere outside the green area of the fan chart. Now that's a slightly ambivalent comment because of course, if you describe the parameters of the distribution, they could determine the distribution outside the green area. And if your density function isn't truncated, it's still possible that the outcome could be anywhere outside, notwithstanding Simon's point about some parts of outside coming only in one day in the, in the what, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 15 billion years since the Big Bang. But as the you know, Greek, you know, the financial crisis associated with you know, the Euro area and Greece gathered pace, the committee decided that it was quite convenient to be able to say that the chance of the breakup of the euro area was less than 
that was its subjective evaluation, so it didn't need to be represented in a fan chart that showed only 90% of the outcomes. Then at one stage, we started to think that the probability was higher than 10%, and that caused separate problems. But uh, anyway, you get the point. Are you saying anything about the tails, or are you just saying something about the central area? And uh, my view was that the MPC was only saying something about the central area. And equally, if the FRB publishes a 70% confidence interval, it doesn't necessarily have to be saying anything about the probability of a contraction of minus 10%, you know, or at least an outturn 10% below its forecast or anything like that. It's only saying what the probability is of being inside the central 70% not where you might be if you're outside it. So those sorts of forecasts we described as censored density forecasts, that you aren't describing the whole of the distribution. So how might you produce censored density forecasts? Well, what the MPC did, at least in in order to produce the initial parameters of its two-part normal distribution was to ignore the, you know, the fact that the distribution outside the 90% might be different, except they didn't completely ignore it because they discarded extreme observations. They were essentially saying that this is what the distribution is like, and, but not if you get an extreme observation, but actually, I don't think we're putting any weight on the possibility about these extreme observations. Anyway, sense of density forecasts quantify risks in the middle of the distribution, but they, and they ignore the magnitude of the outlying observations, but they don't ignore their frequency. So if you were saying that no, there's a major recession once every 20 years on average or something like that. That is roughly what we see since the, in the period since the end of the First World War, every 17 to 20 years. Then if you look at, if you base your data on 10, if you base your analysis on the last 10 years of data and you don't include one of those periods, arguably you're describing outcomes where you aren't going to get one of those extreme observations. But actually what we want to do is to look center stage at the distinction between the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. For part of the distribution, we have a good idea of its shape. When we're outside the uncensored area, all we can do is say that the probability of being in that area is 10%. And that fits the idea that uh, people know more about the probabilities of everyday events than they do about these rarely observed black swan events. Although, of course, black swans are much more common than one day since the Big Bang. Anyway, we consider how to address this. We do so allowing for a fat-tailed model now, we haven't gone the whole hog with fat-tailed models because I thought if you know, the MPC were to adopt something slightly more flexible than the two-part normal distribution, you wouldn't want to give them too many parameters to play with. So no more than one extra parameter to accommodate fat tails, but certainly the issue of skewness, if you think back to those charts that I just showed you, needs to be taken into account. And that then raises the question, is the evidence for fat tails and skewness influenced by the treatment of extreme forecast errors? Is it in fact something that emerges only because we're fitting a known, or because normal practice is to fit a known distribution to all the observations, or would you find it even if you censor the distribution and only fit, say, the central 90% of the distributions. 
So anyway, we consider a general family of skewed distributions uh, you know, as defined by Arellano Valle. Uh, essentially, these are developments of the 19th century two-piece normal distribution, but we don't impose normality. We go, as I say, only with only one extra parameter using the two-part T distribution, and we focus on, margin, on maximum likelihood estimation, although, as I'll make clear, you know, our thinking on the best way of describing what we do has been evolving recently, and uh, it's run slightly ahead of these slides. Anyway, the basic principle of the, of the two-piece T distribution, I think, is fairly clear. We have a parameter gamma, and the, the density function depends on whether the on whether you're on the left-hand side of the location parameter mu or whether you're on the right-hand side of the mode of the distribution, the location parameter mu. But unless gamma is equal to one, you don't have, no, you don't find that the mean and the mode are equal. So this is a distribution that focuses like the Monetary Policy Committee does on the mode it's, as I say, a slight complication of the T distribution. You can work out the probability mass to the left of the mode, the probability mass to the left, to the right of the mode. So with gamma less than one, the distribution is skewed to the right. And not surprisingly, with gamma greater than one, it's skewed to the left. I think that distribution is quite well at least among people who worry about fat tails and skew, I think it's quite well known by now. And from that, we can write down the log likelihood of a signal of a sequence of observations. And we do need an indicator or heaviside function, depending on whether, you know, whether you're on the right of the mode or on the left of the mode that affects the log likelihood. So suppose we don't worry about you no know, censoring, what sort of things do we get when we try and fit those sorts of distributions? So the top chart, and apolog my apologies for the way the labelling worked out in uh, LaTeX, the top chart shows a two-piece T distribution, the shaded areas uh, and a two-piece normal distribution fitted to the MPC's forecast errors. Uh, here, the pale green area of the T distribution includes 40% of the mass because we don't have any sensory. But you can see that actually, even when you don't take any account of the extreme values, beyond fitting a distribution that is quite good at accommodating them, the T distribution with 2.39 degrees of freedom does quite a lot better than the normal distribution at matching the density. I mean, the T distribution is often described as a fat tail distribution, but my sense is that it actually deals rather better with spikes in the center of the distribution. And you can see that more clearly if you look at the lower chart, which shows the same data, but including the minus 22% forecast error from the epidemic. And here you can see that the two-piece T distribution is still doing quite a good job of describing the shape, describing the density function, whereas the two-piece normal distribution is in, in a worse state than it was before the epidemic. And that's because with the two-piece normal distribution, the minus 22, minus 23% has quite a large impact on the parameter value. 
no, much the same thing is observed if you fit you no know, models to the Federal Reserve Board GDP forecast errors. You see once again that the T, T distribution does better than the normal distribution, notwithstanding that uh, there's rather less asymmetry in the pre-pandemic case than there was with the Monetary Policy Committee's forecasts. So what about fitting censored distributions? Well, for the, once we've fitted distributions, we can estimate the 90% best critical region. And here we're working entirely with unimodal distributions. Some people have been you know, questioning that but uh, for, as far as I know, nobody that produces forecasts tries to produce bimodal distributions or multimodal distributions for the forecast outcome. And certainly the central banks focus on uh, unimodal forecast errors. So we're doing the same thing. And then the best critical region is well-defined. So, how do we calculate the censored log likelihood in the uncensored region between YL and YU? It's given by the standard log likelihood formula. If you're below the left-hand censoring point, it's the likelihood of being in that density. If you're above the right-hand censored point, it's the likelihood of being in that region as is expressed here. Now, estimation of this becomes complicated when the sensor points are treated as endogenous. If you know what the sensor points are in absolute values, there's no real difficulty in estimating this. But if you don't know where they are, if you want the censored regions to take up 90%, then estimation becomes more difficult. There's a question, you no, know, you might want to adopt a slightly different form of censored distribution, where you say for the outer 10%, you have no view on whether the points are going to be in the left-hand tail or the right-hand tail. That implies a slightly different uh, log likelihood function, but the same issues really arise. Now, here, maximum likelihood estimation if you use a good algorithm, tends to be degenerate in the case where the, where the cut points are endogenous. And the reason for this is as follows. If your, no, if your scale parameter shrinks towards zero so that you include only one observation in the uncensored region, then you can truncate that you give 90% of the probability mass to that. You've got all the remaining other observations in the censored area, but they don't get very high penalties because they're just given a likelihood based on the probability of being in the censored area. So you don't you know standard maximum likelihood or a good maximum likelihood algorithm really doesn't help you very much even though, as I say, it's easy in the unimodal case to write down the expression for the best critical region, and you can then derive your maximum likelihood problem. So, as I say, well, let me skip that. As I've explained, uh, with a standard maximum likelihood algorithm, the value of sigma shrinks, but the probabilities of being in the, sen in, the un in the censored regions don't rise. So we described what we did as using a fixed point estimator. I think it might be better to describe it as a fixed point algorithm for solving the maximum likelihood problem. And what we find is that if we iterate between estimating the parameters and then calculating the sensor points based on those parameters. If we iterate between the two until the parameters we get converge, 
then the algorithm, provided you start with sensible values, tends to find the maximum likelihood solution that you want rather than the degenerate solution. Now, as to a clear explanation of why that happens, I think at the moment, I don't think we have one, but the intuition is that this algorithm converges rather more slowly than a good high-grade you know, solution algorithm for maximum likelihood, so it never finds the point at which you no know, sigma shrinks to zero and your density function collapses to a single point. Are there multiple like solutions to this problem? Well, all I can say is that in the simulations that we've been doing, we haven't found multiple solutions. Uh, I mean, it is possible to come up with parameter values for which it doesn't, starting values for which it doesn't converge. That's a different matter. If there were multiple solutions, you know, a finite number of multiple solutions, you know, you would choose the one with the highest likelihood. The other point I should mention is that in solving the maximum likelihood problem, you, you don't anywhere impose the condition that you want 10% of the observations to be in the censored region. What we find is that if you use this fixed point approach, you get 10% in large samples, you get 10% of the observations in the uncensored region. If you use the conventional maximum likelihood algorithm, then you get all except one of the observations in the censored region. And so that seems to me a good reason for preferring the, you know, for preferring what doesn't actually maximize the likelihood but the solution that is not the degenerate solution. So this method does give a solution. We find good performance in large samples. In small samples, well, the likelihood A, which you know, imposed a restriction, an extra view on the proportion that ought to be in the left tail and the right tail, it was easier to get that to converge than it was where you were agnostic about whether the, you know, about the proportion of observations in each tail. We did also find a penalized estimator can be helpful, but uh, you know, I think the key message was that actually the fixed point algorithm did work fairly well when you had as few as 50 or 60 observations. So what does the Monetary Policy Committee's forecast error distribution look like if you use the censored estimation method? Well, the top line shows pre-pandemic, the bottom line shows post-pandemic. You still find that the two-part T looks better than the two-part normal, but you also find that there's much less skew than was generated with the, you know, when you fitted the, the, the two-part T distribution or the two-part normal distribution to the full data set. And that perhaps isn't terribly surprising. If you look pre-pandemic, we had a skew term gamma of 1.14. One, you'll remember, is no skew. Uh, with the normal distribution, you think you estimate slightly more skew after the pandemic with the extra observations in the, with the T distribution, the skew had risen to 1.22 or 1.49 with the normal distribution. But in essence, what I think emerges from this is that if you're fitting a censored distribution, then skew is likely to be rather less of an issue than when you are trying to fit an uncensored distribution. On the other hand, if people try and fit uncensored distributions, they have the problem of accommodating the minus eights 
and the minus 22s, which probably even with a fat-tailed T distribution should be only happening once in a few million years. Thank you very much. So questions, please. Gary. This is inspired by something you said about these, um, your split T distribution on spikiness and fat tails. Now this just had me thinking that there's another distribution that's even better at those, the Laplace distribution. And there is an asymmetric Laplace distribution. And so I was thinking that maybe I'd make a suggestion you consider that as well, but then that's quantile regression. The asymmetric Laplace distribution gives you likelihood based inference quantile regression, which just raises the general point, how does what you're doing relate to quantile regression over that relevant interval? I think the answer is that what I'm trying to do is you know, fit a parametric distribution to the censored interval. Well, you've just explained that quantile regression is a different parametric distribution. So perhaps my answer ought to be, I'm trying to fit something which isn't too unfamiliar for people who have been fitting split normal distributions or conventional Gaussian distributions. largely just trying to ensure that I understand what you're doing. Um, so you're talking about the degenerate solution that you can get if you don't constrain the problem properly when you're trying to use standard maximum likelihood methods. But it, I believe you also said that in choosing your cut points, you're not imposing the restriction that you need a certain fraction of the observations lying in the sensor region. But presumably, as soon as you impose that restriction, you no longer have to identify two cut points because once you have one cut point that implicitly defines the other subject to the coverage constraint, and wouldn't that then make straight maximum likelihood estimation uh, non-degenerate? I think it probably would make it non-degenerate. And you know, in talking to James about revisions, we decided that that was perhaps something to, to examine at a later stage. The, you know, what worried, um, I mean, this really shows my ignorance on the issue that though the contribution to the likelihood is calculated point by point, and I couldn't then see an immediate way of easily totting up the number of observations that you get in the required range. But I think with, a, you know, with some resolution of that, you then would find that you'd no longer get the degenerate solution. So I'm trying to understand whether what you're doing is almost simply Windsorizing the tails out of the data and therefore improving the robustness of the estimation significantly. And so by excluding the tails, of course, you could fit the tails using some extreme value theory, but you've thrown away those extremes. And then you're saying simply, well, the center of the distribution looks more symmetric. It's more robust because we don't have extreme values that we know from maximum likelihood. One extreme value can pull the distribution any way you like in most cases. And I'm just wondering whether that's another way of looking at what you've done here. My, my understanding of Windsorization is that you replace, say, the points beyond the 95th percentile by the 95th percentile. We aren't doing that 
we're replacing the likelihood of the point beyond the cut point with the you know, calculating it from the probability of being in that region contingent on the parameters estimated from the unsensored region. Yeah, I think that's something precise I mean, winterization, but something yeah, in that I'm, spirit. I mean, it, 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 it's related, but it's, it's not the same thing as, you know, as the way I think of winterization. But yes, it, it is related. And I think if you look at you know, the standard results on the estimation of sensor distributions where you know the sensor point, then there is obviously a close relationship with winterization. Well, I should think people want to move to tea now. So thank you very much for attending this session.